Hello. Um, yes. Uh, I'm, my name is Michael Legg. I have, I'm a PhD student at Cardiff Next Universities. Um, I'm, I'm quite glad I'm going last, to be honest, um, because there's been some there's been some amazing, incredible, deeply scientific research that's just blown my mind these last few hours. Um, and I'm going to just go really low tech for like the next sort of 15 minutes. So bear with me, forgive me. Um, so for context, um, I'm entering the final year of my PhD project, uh, which examines the treatment of the dead in the Iron Age of Eastern England. Um, so Adele covers that bit. I'm doing that bit over there. Um, through a combination of osteological techniques, macroscopic taphonomy, uh, and archaeological theory, uh, I am discussing demography and health, as well as post-mortem treatment, and what this may tell us about regional Iron Age society. Uh, so this paper is actually covering a really small sort of subset of my larger PhD project. Most of what I do is inhumations. Um, this will be dealing with disarticulated bone. Um, I don't want to waste time reiterating what Adele's said with regards to the Iron Age. So um, yes, the Iron Age covers 800 BC to about a generation after 43 AD. Uh, my study region is the area in purple, which broadly covers the modern day counties of Lincolnshire, Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, Bedfordshire, Suffolk, Hertfordshire, Essex and Kent. Um, and within this period, same as within Adele's region, you find tiny fragments um, or, or larger fragments of disarticulated bone in pretty much every imaginable context. They are found in all site types. Uh, they are found in pits, ditches, uh, in, in roundhouse gullies, in wells, everywhere you think you might find little bits of human bone, they are there. Um, and since at least 1970, it's been widely suggested that these people are being placed on excavation platforms and being exposed outside. Um, and more recently, arguments have come up to, to, to combat this theory. Some of these, some of these authors have been you know, discussing it for quite a while. Um, and as Adele has just explained for the West of the country. So what I've been trying to do is see if these conclusions, if these arguments are applicable for my study region, because most of the research has been done in sort of, sort of here across. Um, and, you know, which parts of people are being deposited? Are there patterns in, in their selection choices is what really interests me. Uh, and what taphonomic um, evidence is left macroscopically on the bone that might tell us about the various <coughs> post-mortem processes that are being undertaken. Um, so the material under study uh, amounts to 75 assemblages, totaling around 395 bones or, or deposits. Um, representing the majority of all the disarticulated bone from my study region. Um, examination was all undertaken at the, at the um, storage location using 20 times and 10 times uh, hand lenses um, with USB microscopes with built-in cameras to sort of um, confirm or disprove more questionable modifications um, and, and, and taphonomic um, alterations. And I was looking for signs of weathering, trampling, gnawing, abrasion, fractures, um, polishing, cut marks, chop marks, bone working, um, according to established criteria like the FFI scores and Baron Sire's uh, weathering stages. Uh, so this is my geographic distribution. Fun colours, isn't it? Um, so <laughs> bones from the Cambridgeshire region make up about 40% of the total, but there's also a fair representation in, in Lincolnshire and Hertfordshire and Kent. Um, on the map, each pin represents one assemblage. The bigger the pin, the more material found within that assemblage. Um, so Norfolk and Suffolk on the coast, pretty much nothing. Uh, I, would, I would suggest, I'm pretty sure that this is a result of quite, quite acidic soils having a serious effect on, on my material here. But there appears to be a sort of conglomeration of, um, right here, of, of, sort of um, Heavy activity, heavy occupation in this sort of region, representing southern Cambridgeshire, um, eastern Hertfordshire, northern Bedfordshire, um, and I think that's I think that's real as a as a conglomeration. Um, so this graph shows the number of bones identifiable to each element uh, over the entire assemblage of some four hundred bones, bone fragments, and it's pretty clear that. They're mostly skulls. It's pretty much all uh, skulls. There's 152 instances of, of cranial bones. Um, the next thing would be femora, but there's only there's 52 uh, femoral bones. 
even if you collect together all the sort of major long bones into one, one long bone category, um, you still only have 129 of those compared to 152 skulls. Uh, and at, at least nearly, nearly every site in the region has at least one skull fragment somewhere. Um, I should also point out as well that if, if you find five fragments of a parietal in a pit, that's one on this graph. That's not five. It's not um, sort of overrepresenting the fragmentary nature of, of skulls. Um, now, obviously, there's issues with this. Um, smaller bones, um, less distinctive bones, are more likely to get to get lost or to be ignored. Certain elements might not survive as well. You know, uh, scapulae, for example, they're probably underrepresented here. But I think there is a there's a real pattern. I think there's the selecting skulls, uh, and that's something that the, Johanna, Johanna said, you know, you have movement of particular bones, skulls are being taken out of the back end, and I think that's what we have here as well. Um, so I wondered if other factors are playing a role in which bones are being chosen. Um, so I looked at sidedness, and that appears not really to have much of an effect. 47% um, of those that could be sided were from the left, 53 from the right. Uh, sex is a little bit trickier. Um, in the adult bones of those that I could sex, it initially appears that there's um, more male than female, about 60-40 split, but the numbers of those are really quite small, and I think what really you have here is that more sort of male, more masculine characteristics are easier to identify in fragmented remains, and that you may have sort of an overestimation. I don't think it's statistically really that relevant. Um, Age, though, does seem to be uh, a clear selection factor. Um, those individuals under about three years of age are better represented than any other sub-adult period. Um, I think this may be because identifying neonate bones to a specific age group is easier than it would be for, for, for older children, especially if you don't have fusion centers. Um, but adults of you know, over, over, over 20 years are overwhelmingly what we are finding here. Um, yeah. So, actual to follow them. And there's really not that much. Um, in looking for signs of subaerial exposure or the lack of signs of subaerial exposure, um, I was expecting to find weathering, gnawing, trampling, erosion, some indications that these bones have been left, left open to the elements. Of the 395 bones, 11 were weathered, um, all to stage 1 to 2, which is, uh, it fits, it fits the climate, it's quite temperate climate. Um, of those, none had any other signs of any other modification. Another 9 bones had gnawing marks, um, mostly rodent. Um, of those, one was also trampled, and that's the only trampled bone from the whole assemblage. Um, so only 20 had any sign of, of natural taphonomic modification. Um, taphonomic overprinting is going to be a factor here, especially with the weathered material. Um, and obviously you have to deal with the taphonomic paradox of the stuff that um, may have been more extensively modified or more extensively affected may not have survived at all. Um, all but one of the, the gnawed bones were long bones because um, that's kind of expected. It's, it's much less likely that a cranial bone is going to be gnawed, and most of it is cranial bones. Um, but the weathered bones are around a 50-50 split. Um, so what about other modifications? Cut marks were present on 25 bones, four of which were also chopped, um, and seven in total had, had chop marks. Um, so already more elements have uh, evidence of human manipulation than they do of a natural modification. Um, 13 elements were, were worked in some way beyond one or two sort of cut marks. Um, seven of these were also cut and five were also polished. Um, and some of these worked bones were turned into, uh, into objects or, or sort of, uh, so digging tools in some cases or bowls or, or pendants and things like that. 31 bones were polished. Uh, and in most, if, all, if not all cases, it appears to be the result of, of handling and curation rather than the action of, of, of water or all natural sources, because um, the same bones also have cut marks. They also have, have been shaped and chopped and worked. So this is, this is the femur that you can't tell on the screen so much. On my screen, trust me, it looks better. 
Um, but it has it's been it's been smooth and polished to, to a point in the end, and you also have these cut marks part way along. Um, so generally, what we're seeing um, is that the majority of the surviving material is made up of adult cranial bones um, of both sexes. Seventy three percent have are completely unaltered, um, and of those that are, human manipulation is far more common. Natural taphonomic alteration. I'm really sorry for how blurry those photos are. Um, so what's what's happening? What's going on? Um, and it seems that here, as with other better studied parts of the country, um, in line with the conclusions that Adele has found using far more high tech methods than me, um, people in the Iron Age are not being exposed outside. They are being protected during decay um, and then manipulated later on. Um, a few of these bones have been radiocarbon dated, and there are cases of curation. Um, several of them have produced dates decidedly earlier than their, their, their contextual surroundings. So I have uh, cases of inhumations uh, in ditches with skull fragments sort of dotted along and, and with. And the skull fragments date to 80 to 200 years earlier than the inhumations that they have been placed with. Um, in Billingsborough in Lincolnshire um, and in Helpringham Fen, they are perforating cranial fragments for suspension. The, this is uh, a, it's, it's a frontal, it's, been, it's the wrong way up, but this is cut marks along here. And these appear to be waste fragments from cutting along here to create a bowl or a container of some kind. Um, it's, it's quite cool, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Um, skulls are found over and over, manipulated, retained. So far from exposure, what we have is protection and the selection of bones for a complex post-mortem process. Um, and one final point to kind of support this idea, in gathering all this data, as I said, <coughs> also, I'm also dealing with a lot of inhumations, inhumations in pits, inhumations in ditches. I don't get middens in, as, in the same ways that you get in the West. Um, but I found at least 12 examples of semi-articulated and incomplete inhumations. Um, so one example from Kent contained 50% uh, of an adult male skeleton with the head, the left arm and left leg missing. Um, another one from Bedfordshire contained the body of a neonate, again with no head, um, and the right arm was also missing. Another one from Essex, uh, a crouched inhumation of an adult male, no skull, but there were loose teeth found in the grave and the rest of the skeleton was complete. Um, so this might tie in with uh, what Edeltraud and, and Astrid were saying about sort of the revisitation for different purposes, because they're not revisiting to take artifacts and to move things, they're revisiting, I think, to take elements. Um, and I believe that these kind of incomplete burials are what's left over from the process of a primary burial as part of a protracted postmortem process involving the exhumation of skulls or other important or, uh, or more valuable, however you consider it, elements uh, after defleshing for reuse and reuse and curation. And that's why the taphonomic markers on these bones are so rare. Thank you.